All right, thank you. So yeah, Matthew chapter number 26. We're going to be taking the Lord's Supper this evening. <clears throat> So we refer to it as the Lord's Supper because the Bible does. We refer to it as Passover because the Bible refers to it as Passover. It's the New Testament pass to Passover, albeit. Uh, we also refer to it as communion. And we're going to look at a few of these passages and why we and, and where we get those titles from. You know, I believe that the Lord's Supper is something that is uh, it's very sober. It's, it's very serious. It's, 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 it's uh, meant to be something that's solemn. And I get that from the passage when I read the passage and everything that takes place um, in that event in the Bible. Here in Matthew chapter number 26 is actually where we find that. It's also where we find the betrayal of Christ. And we're going to go through this in just a moment. And, and uh, here at the end, I'm going to walk through, as I mentioned uh, in announcements, the accompanying uh, uh, passages with each practice or each act that we are about to do. So we're going to read the passage about breaking the bread. I'm going to break the bread and distribute it to each family. And then also we're going to do the same thing with the cup ex itself. But I want to give you some, uh, uh, just some thoughts this evening before we take part. As I mentioned, it's very serious and it's a very uh, sobering and solemn thing to take part in. And I'm going to show you that from Scripture and I'm going to show you why. Some of this will be reiterated from last year, but I'm also going to give you some new thoughts. Now, one thing I want to open with is that we as New Testament Christians really only have two uh, 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 ordinances in the New Testament. We have baptism and we have the Lord's Supper. And both of those we should take very seriously. Knowing also that we only <coughs> excuse me, have two of them. Baptism is very important and all of us understand that here. And we all try very hardly to get someone, very hard to get someone uh, to get baptized. We should feel the same way with the Lord's Supper. We should have just as, as much reverence and significance in our mind towards the Lord's Supper. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that in my heart and in my uh, perception, at least in the past, that I didn't view the Lord's Supper, I feel like, as, as important or as highly as I should have. Um, when reading Scripture, it's, it is a very significant a practice that is given to us. As I said, there's only two ordinances. Baptists, I feel, don't hold uh, the Lord's Supper as high as they should. I don't feel that they you know, uh, practice it in such a way that it, isn't, it is as important as it should be. And they don't magnify it, I don't think, even in their preaching and, and things it's not touched on as much. But it is a very serious ordinance. So I want to open with, it's only one of the two ordinances. I believe that it is even, uh, it would be reasonable, let's say that, to, to think that it is even more important. And the reason why is Jesus, when He instituted this particular ordinance, baptism only takes place one time. But this is something that happens over and over and over again. So that obviously shows you that there is a difference there. And I want to go over a couple of the differences with baptism and uh, communion or the Lord's Supper. Now, both of them are meant to be tangible. They're meant to be, <coughs> excuse me, and this is what ordinances are, uh, they're meant to be something that you can put your hands on. And the reason why is it's meant to cause you to think about that in another way. It, it, it's meant to be fleshly and real and put before you. And that's going to make a lot of sense when I get into these few thoughts that I want to give you before we partake in the Lord's Supper this evening. The difference in the tangible way or the tangible, uh, the way in which each, both of these are tangible is this. Number one, baptism is just meant to be a profession. It's tangible. You feel the water. You go into the water. You can envision it. You can picture it. But it's just meant to be a profession. Communion has three points, I believe, to it. And as I said, it's something that is repeated, that you're supposed to do over and over again, according to the Bible. <coughs> um, I'm going to give you I'm gonna, these three components. I'm going to go ahead and go over what these three components are and that are found in Scripture, and then I'll elaborate on each point quickly, and then we'll actually partake. Number one is reflection. Reflection is something that is supposed to take place at the moment of com communion or the Lord's Supper. Number two is remembrance. Number two is remembrance. So reflection, remembrance. And then number three is communion. And in that exact order. So reflection, also this is going to be uh, uh, speaking of like examining yourself. Reflection. Number two, remembrance and communion. And it's very important that they be in that exact order. I want you to look with me here at Matthew chapter number 26. We're going to look at verse number 17 and we're going to look at reflection. Now I don't believe that it is a coincidence that this takes place just prior to 
them partaking of the Lord's Supper. Look at verse number 17. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Notice there it's referred to as the Passover. And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? So I want you to notice at this moment that they began to do reflection. This is, you know, uh, also we would refer to this as introspect. They kind of started looking at, the, looking at themselves and examining themselves. They said, Lord, is it I? So we see there the reflection. Look at verse 23. And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. So notice the introspect. Notice how they examined themselves and they did reflection upon themselves. And you know what you see in this passage is you see great humility. Some people look at the, the disciples when they do certain things and say certain things and, and I understand this and I can you know, uh, relate to this as well. When I read uh, the disciples, sometimes they seem like they're almost like the three stooges in things that they'll do and say. And I've heard people criticize this before but I actually would do the exact opposite other than criticizing it. I would I would, uh, you know, I would, I would praise the disciples in this sense. And the whole reason why they responded with, Lord, is it I, is because they had such great humility. They had such great humility and they understood their own sinful nature. They understood their, they had self-knowledge in the sense that they understood that what they are capable of and the wickedness that they could do of their own heart. So what it is, it's a good time to reflect upon your own sins. It's a good time to reflect upon your own problems. Every single person in here has sins in their life right now. I don't know all of them. I don't really know any of them, but you do. And you know what? This is a time where you need to reflect upon the problems and the sins that you have in your own life. Whatever you're struggling with, dig down deep into your heart and you know the problems that you have. You know the sins that you've committed and the things that you struggle with on a daily basis. And you need to pull those things up and you need to examine yourselves. And that's what you need to do is you need to be honest with who you are as a person. We're all sinful. Sinful. What did Christ say, you know, about, about man? He, he didn't need any man to testify of man because he already knew how man was, right? He knows the sinful nature of man and he already knows your true heart. You're not hiding anything from him. So what you need to do is you need to look at your life and say, Lord, is it I? The very first thing that we need to do is we need to examine ourselves. We need to reflect. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And as I said, this is not a coincidence. This is something that needs to take place at the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Uh, the Lord will say things to, to prompt thoughts and to cause people to think about certain things. And I believe that makes perfect sense of why Jesus brought that up. Because it caused them to do reflection. Because the time of the Lord's Supper is a time to reflect. It's a time to examine ourselves. It's a time to ask the Lord to try us. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Look at verse number 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Notice this is very serious. It's something we need to take very serious. Look at verse 8, or 28, I'm sorry. <coughs> but let a man examine himself, and so, that means afterwards, if you will, let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So notice here that we have a commandment to examine ourselves. We're told to examine ourselves. We need to stop and reflect and examine ourselves. And it's something that's very serious. As I said, examine yourself. You know your own sins. You know your own heart. And you need to uh, identify those things. Identify your sins and bring them to remembrance in your own mind. The second point is remembrance. So first we see reflection, introspect, examine our hearts, examine ourselves, identify our sins, confess our sins, and ask for forgiveness as well at this moment. Get your, your heart right and cleanse your heart. We need to do that prior to partaking. Make sure your heart is right with the Lord. And if it's not, don't partake. This is just like uh, when we uh, did the, the charity offering. You know, if you would be giving you know, uh, uh, and it would grieve you, don't give. 
honestly, and if, if you feel bothered to take it, if you're not sure about your heart, whether your heart's right, don't take it. And obviously it's very important that the heads of the households, uh, that they manage things well in this type of situation as well. If you have children that are saved, that are maybe not to the age where you feel comfortable with them taking it, it may be better if they do not take it. That's just my own personal advice. You have to make the, your decision for your own family. But it may be best if they don't take it. Uh, um, especially if maybe you didn't have the opportunity to speak to them, you could take a couple of minutes and make sure that they understand it, make sure that they're getting their heart right and that they're prepared. Because if you're in a bad place and you take this, I don't want to be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus. That's pretty bad. So it's pretty serious. It's, it's something that is, uh, we should be very sober about and it's, it's, it's solemn. So make sure your heart's right. Identify your sins. Ask for forgiveness from the Lord. Second point, as I said, is remembrance. I want you to look with me at Luke chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22. <clears throat> uh, one thing I want to point out, you're going to see this, is that the whole purpose of the Lord's Supper is to remember, the overall purpose of why we do it is to, is to remember, to bring in remembrance what Jesus Christ did for us. Now, the Lord's Supper is not the resurrection. The Lord's Supper is not, let me say this and I'm very clear about this, the Lord's Supper is not something that's pretty that should be going on in your mind. The Lord's Supper is something that is, it, you, it, you could even say is gruesome. The Lord's Supper is something that is very hard to swallow, with no pun intended there, right? The Lord's Supper is something that is actually meant to bring to mind the suffering and the agony and the broken flesh and the poured out blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to look with me at Luke chapter number 22, verse number 19. I've never heard anyone explain this, but it's, it's definitely what the Bible's teaching. Look at verse 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, a lot of times we dress up ordinances. And, you know, I say just, you know, Christendom in general. You know, everybody who considers themselves a Christian is who, what Christendom is. They dress up ordinances. We think of how the Catholic Church does ordinances, or even those that are, you know, Catholic, light, Episcopal, and all these churches, Presbyterian. They dress it up and they make it real beautiful. They make it real pretty. But this is meant to be the exact opposite in your mind. The Lord wants you to remember that the bread that we're breaking, He wants you to think of and, and, and draw uh, uh, to remembrance and bring to remembrance His body that was broken for you and His flesh that was given for you. You know, when we partake in the, in the bread... It's what you need to be <coughs> thinking about at that moment and remembering is what Jesus went through for your salvation. Remember, both ordinances, both of them are something tangible, as I mentioned, but they're specifically tangible to your salvation. Both of them. They both symbolize your salvation. And they both focus, have their focuses on somewhat of different parts. You know, baptism kind of covers the whole gambit. But specifically, the Lord's Supper has nothing to do with the resurrection. It has something to do with the suffering and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus was taking the bread and breaking the bread, He was literally wanting in your mind, He was, he was symbolizing His flesh being torn apart. His flesh being ripped by the nails going into His hands. His flesh being ripped by the whips that are hitting Him on the back. His flesh being ripped when the, when the crown of thorns were shoved on His head. It was broken and it was given for you. And what you are to do is, is remember that. You're supposed to draw to remembrance Jesus Christ's suffering. This is where we focus and we spend time on remembering the death of Christ. On Sunday we'll remember the resurrection. But tonight we remember the death of Christ. And you know they both have their glories. Both of them do. You know the Bible emphasizes the resurrection more but that doesn't mean that the, the death of Christ isn't glorious. He was suffering for me. He was suffering and taking what I deserve. I deserve to be hung on that cross. I deserve to take those punishments. I deserve the, 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 the punishment that He took. You deserve that punishment. And you need to be thinking about that. It's a, that's why it's a time to bring to remembrance your sins and to examine yourself. It's a time to examine your sins and notice how He, he connects that and He relates that to the, the bread and the flesh being broken for you. That's why we draw to remembrance our sins. He did that for your sins. That's why the resurrection isn't focused. That's why this is the time. 
you got to think about the fact that Jesus Christ was on that cross because of you and because of me. Sometimes those thoughts connect a little bit more than others. And this is a time and this is a place where that's supposed to happen. Where, where it's a lot clearer in your mind, where you have some clarity and you really can connect the dots between the fact that He was dying in your place. He was dying for you. He was being beaten because He loves you and that's what you deserve and He wanted to take it so that you didn't have to. That was the reason why He was hanging on that cross. And you know, Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the whole world from past, present to future. He paid for the sins that you will commit in the future and you have not committed yet. And I want you to think about this concept. He knows the beginning from the end and however many that that ends up being, however many tallies and, and, and stripes that ends up me, being on his back, he paid for that. But you still have free will and you can choose to take a few stripes off his back. And I believe that this is meant at this moment of reflection and paired with, simultaneously being used with remembrance of those sins that you commit when you examine yourselves and it brings your sins to the forefront of your mind, at the same time you're to be thinking about His death and suffering on the cross. Do you know what you understand there? Is those sins that you have in your heart are the sins that He died for. Those sins that you have in your life right now that you're struggling with are the sins and the whole reason why His flesh was broken and His blood was spilled out. So these two things are meant to be used together to try to clean your life up. Oftentimes, people, when they get baptized, they have something tangible. I know that my life didn't change until right when I was baptized. And I tell people that oftentimes. If you're not baptized right away, you're probably not going to do anything until you get baptized. Not that there's some power in that or anything like that, but something tangible helps you. And I believe even for the Christian that's living his life, you know, straight edge and, and, and desiring to serve the Lord, you're still going to have sins in your life, but this can be something tangible that you can use to maybe get some sins out of your life, to maybe live a little bit more sanctified and please the Lord a little bit more. Take a few stripes off His back. Let, a, let His flesh not be broken one more time. Think about that. You could, you could prevent certain, certain you know, marks and sores and whatever it may be from His back. Not only that, the blood, I want you to think about this, it's not something pretty, it's something gruesome. Do you know what the blood represents? Jesus' blood being poured out. I want you to think about, it, about the two together when the spear was shoved into his side and there's blood being poured out of his side. Think about that. Blood just being poured out of his side. So much for analogies not being used that, are, that or were something sinful in the past. I want you to think about that symbolism. It's a, it's a sin to drink blood in the Old Testament. But what is this supposed to represent? Drinking the Lord's blood. Notice that this is something that's gruesome. The Bible, I've heard this said before, you know, by the, the notorious Peter Ruckman, and it's 100% right. The Bible is an extremely bloody book. And, you know, this is not necessarily something that's pretty. It's, it's, it's meant to get your life right and get your heart right. So, you know what it represents is the pain and the agony and the suffering that he went through. Think about that. When you take a drink of that, that that's Jesus' blood that was shed for you and meant to cleanse your soul. This is meant to be something physical that represents salvation, that you, you ate of His flesh and you drank of His blood. And in receiving His sacrifice, He cleansed your soul. So it's something tangible that represents or symbolizes something spiritual. So it's meant to focus on and to bring in remembrance, to bring in remembrance His death and His suffering and His agony and misery. That's what it's meant to bring in remembrance specifically. A lot of times you don't view it as being such, but that's what it is. It's meant to bring into, some, bring into mind something uh, uh, that is uh, not the prettiest thing. Now the third point is communion. As I said, number one, reflection. Reflect upon yourself. Examine yourself. Number two, remembrance. Bring to remembrance and think about the death on the cross while you partake in the Lord's Supper. Number three is communion. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter number uh, 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Look at verse number 16. It says this, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not, watch this, the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now you don't need to turn there. I'll read it to you. 2 Corinthians 6 gives us the definition of the word communion. <clears throat> 
The word communion means fellowship. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse 14, you may have this memorized, pretty popular verse. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what? Fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. The word fellowship means communion. This is a moment where we can have fellowship with the Lord. It's meant to be a moment that's intimate. It's meant to be a moment that's serious. When, when Jesus was seated with his disciples, it was a very serious moment. It was a very sombering, solemn moment when he was breaking the bread. It's very obvious when you read that. And it's meant to be something very serious. And this is meant to be a very real, intimate moment with you and the Lord. That's why it begins with reflection and digging down deep into your heart and praying to the Lord. Pray to the Lord as well. When you identify all the sins, pray to the Lord as well as David did to cleanse you from secret faults. Any sins maybe that you may not have. Notice that this is all leading to repairing any fellowship that may have been broken in the past. This is all leading to fixing that. There's a very real and obvious purpose of uh, communion or the Lord's Supper. And it is ultimately to bring about communion, so it's rightfully called communion. It's meant to bring about fellowship. This is a way to restore your fellowship or to restore your walk with the Lord, maybe if it's broken, as I said. So communion is the, the end purpose, it's the end goal, it's the objective of all of this, is to have a moment where we commune. It's like speaking with, like fellowshipping with the Lord. This, needs, this moment needs to be spent in prayer. You should be praying to the Lord while you're partaking in this. You should be praying to the Lord. You should be talking to the Lord. Begin with, as I said, <coughs> go to Psalm chapter 77, verse 6. Begin with, as I said, reflection. Begin with reflection, where you reflect, you examine yourselves, dig down deep into your heart, make sure you're getting your heart right. Whoops. Make sure you're getting your heart right with the Lord. Uh, identify all of your sins. Even after you've identified the sins you're aware of, ask the Lord to cleanse you from your secret faults. Examine yourself. Confess those sins and ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Next is remembrance. When you think about your sins, how bad they are, how many you have, whatever it may be, after you've identified those, couple those and understand that that is the reason why his, 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 his body was broken. That's the reason why his flesh was broken. That's the reason why his blood had to be spilled out or poured out, as they did with the drink offering in the Old Testament. Think about that. Remembrance. Call to remembrance His death. While you're praying, think about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that and, and how He did that. He did that, and if you think about this in the larger scale, He did that so that we could have communion with Him in the sense of salvation. He did that so we could have fellowship with Him at all. You know, without that, the, the holiest of all, we couldn't enter in. Without that, we couldn't approach the mercy seat. Without that, we couldn't go to heaven. He did that so we could have communion with Him. <clears throat> Thirdly, it's communion. It's communion. It's a moment to fellowship with Him, to pray to Him. Restore your relationship with Him if it's broken. Get your heart right with Him. Find any sins. Confess them. Forsake them. Draw to remembrance. Bring to remembrance what He did for you. And spend time praying to the Lord. And take this time serious. Just as if you were there at the table with the Lord. I mean, how magnificent would that be? Being able to sit with the Lord and Him breaking the bread and handing it to Him and you could actually look at the flesh that represented was represented by the bread. Think about that. Try to uh, make this as real as you can be. It's meant to be something tangible. That's the purpose. Something tangible means something you can hold and feel in your hands. It's tangible. Something that's real and visible to you and brings it to life. And that's what we want to do. That's the point. Envision his flesh when you see the bread. Envision uh, uh, his blood being spilled out when you see the fruit of the vine. Look now, Psalm 77, verse 6. This encapsulates the three points just in different order. He says, if you look at the end of verse 6, And my spirit made diligent search. That's what we need to do. We need to make diligent search within our spirit and with our spirit, in our hearts, and examine ourselves. We also need to bring to remembrance, it says in verse 6, I call to remembrance my song in the night. We need to bring it to remembrance. And then number three, <clears throat> commune. Commune. I commune with mine heart. It's interesting how he words that as well. I commune with mine heart. 
So that's what we do. We're going to be speaking to the Lord from our hearts. And dig down deep in there, as I said. There, those are those three points, albeit they're in different orders, but we have those three points that really are the three main components of the Lord's Supper. The three main components of the Lord's Supper. And it is, in this order, begin with, we have examining yourself, and it is reflection. Number two is remembrance. And number three is Communion. Now, I close my Bible, but I do want to go back to Matthew chapter 26. I apologize. I should have told you to stay there. Matthew chapter number 26. Uh, we're also, before I, <coughs> excuse me, before I distribute the bread, I am going to pray for the bread and bless the bread. We saw that mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11, but they also do that in verse 26. That's why it comes from, chap uh, from the Lord's Supper, and that's why they do it in 1 Corinthians 11, because that takes place and did take, pl take place Excuse me, uh, at the Lord's Supper. Look at Matthew 26, look at verse number 26. It says this, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now at this time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the bread. I'm going to uh, pray once I have the bread here and bless the bread. And uh, I'm going to distribute the bread then at that moment. You take a few minutes and uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes, one to two minutes, uh, just to, uh, to do that. Uh, prior to that, uh, just as we did last year, what I would like to do is I would like to give you, uh, let's say, I'll even give you up to, I'll give you two to three minutes. Let's do that. Let's do three minutes exactly. I'm going to look at my phone. I'll give you, I want you to take three minutes and get your heart right. Just let's make 100% sure. Be 100%. Have the heart of the disciples and say, Lord, is it I? Make diligent search in your heart. Of course, no one wants to take of it unworthily. No one wants to, to not discern the Lord's body. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, that you would be worthy of the body and the blood of Jesus, not discerning the Lord's body. What does it mean to discern, to understand? Discern also has to do with seeing something. Notice it's, a, it's supposed to be something that's visible. Discern the Lord's body. So take about three minutes now of silence, please. And, and uh, 7.45, at 7.48, I'll come back up and I'm going to bless the bread. And then I'm going to uh, break and distribute the bread. So take three minutes. <clears throat>
<clears throat> All right, at this time I'm going to pray for the bread. And as I said, I'm going to come to each family then at that moment. And just as Jesus did, I'm going to break the bread and I'll distribute a piece that will be for you and your family. It's not meant, obviously, <clears throat> to be a, a meal, but it's just meant to have something tangible that we can see the Lord's body breaking before our eyes and envision what He went through for us. So at this time, as I said, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father God, uh, we thank you so much, Jesus, for what you did for us. We thank you for your, your body and your blood being broken and spilled for us. We thank you for the suffering and the agony. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for everything that you went through uh, so that we might have life. You had to, of course, die. We thank you for taking our punishment. Um, we thank you for paying our wages. Help us to reflect upon this at this time, dear Lord God. Help us to, to take it very serious, to understand it in its, in its uh, true sense of what you went through for us. Just make it real in our minds that we might be more grateful and serve you more and, uh, and be more zealous from it. Uh, just help us, dear Lord God, to have the, the, the strongest understanding possible that we could of what you truly went through and also what this moment is supposed to be for us. We thank you so much for uh, uh, giving us the communion and the Lord's Supper and, and having something tangible. We thank you that we can have fellowship with you and that you became a man and you sat down at the table with your disciples just as we're your disciples. And you, you, you communed with them, and you spoke with them, and you sang a hymn with them, and you prayed with them. Uh, we want this moment to be as real as we can, fellowshipping with you and communing with you. We love you so much, and we know that your, your flesh being broken was the only thing that made this possible. Help us to, to reverence that. Not this bread. This bread is just any bread bought at the store. And help us not to reverence this physical piece of bread, but what you actually went through and what this represents. Help us to, to hold as highly as can possibly be your death in our minds and, and uh, everything that you went to went through so that we would be thankful for it. We love you so much and in Jesus Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> so this actually broke a little bit already, so I'll give you that. That's already broken, there you go. Look with me again at Matthew chapter number 26. We'll also look at verse number 27. <clears throat> it says this, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. So he handed the cup around, and they obviously had one cup in that situation, and he said, Make sure that you drink all of it. So that's important when I hand you the cup, just as I hope you did with the bread as well. Make sure that you drink all of it. And uh, just, of course, uh, uh, hand it to those in the family that are saved only and those also that, and obviously you manage the household as I said. Um, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also now, I'm gonna, I'll get the, the cups here and then I will pray. And then I'm going to give thanks for this as well. And then I'll hand these out to the families. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. 
um, as the Lord thanked you, just kind of reflect back on that same moment in the same way I'm praying to the same God and thanking the same God for uh, giving us Jesus, for Jesus. Thank you for uh, His blood that was spilled. Thank you for uh, loving us so much and becoming man. We're so thankful for what you've done for us. We love you and, we're, and help us, help us to, to, to uh, use this moment of reflection, dear God, in our hearts and uh, thinking about what you went through because of our sin. Uh, help us to be thankful for that. Uh, there's nothing more that we could be thankful for. Help us to be thankful for spilling your blood and that God, the Holy Ghost, is who purchased us with his own blood. We love you so much. And uh, help us please to, to take this seriously and to be thankful for your death. We love you and in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>as I said, this can be a moment to get any kind of sin out of our lives. It can be a moment to maybe just get closer to God in whatever way that we can. Just bring ourselves closer to God. It's a moment, uh, it's meant to be a moment of communion where we commune uh, with the Lord. We, we speak to the Lord. We pray to the Lord. We, uh, you know, as I said, deep, dig down deep in our hearts. These types of tangible things, they're, they're very good to be used in our lives it's good that we do it once a year, but they're very good to be used in our lives just to, as I said, put us back on that right path. Or maybe just help us to stay on that right path. Maybe just to walk a little bit straighter. Even if you, you feel like, or maybe you really are walking straight. Maybe it can just help you walk a little bit straighter. So, I believe that the Lord's Supper is very important. I believe that Baptist churches, they don't take it as important. I believe that if you are able to sit down next to Jesus during the Lord's Supper, I believe that you would think it's a lot more important too if you could actually sit there and experience it with Him. I bet when He said, this do in remembrance of me, I bet those words rang in the ears of the disciples after He was gone. And they thought about Him and they wanted to see Him and they thought about His death, especially those disciples that looked and actually saw it. Imagine being one of the disciples that was there and ate with Him and what a joyful moment that that was at that time, and then imagine the very next day actually seeing his flesh being broken, actually seeing his blood being poured out. I bet that made the Lord's Supper a lot more real. He, the, the, the Bible is a living book and it be, can become alive in our minds more than anything. We need to take those images that the Bible paint, paints for us, we need to take those and we need to cause those to resurface in our minds. We need to uh, dwell upon those at the moment of the Lord's Supper and truly commune with Him and be thankful with Him. And what greater 
you know, fellowship can we have with the Lord, you know, after Him bridging that gap between what? Between man and God. And how did He do it? I want you to think about that. How did He do it? What was it that actually bridged the gap and brought communion? Think about that. What was it that brought communion between God and man? It was the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what brought communion between. Man. That's what enables us and allows us to have the communion that we have. And then that same precious blood and flesh, sinless, the pure blood of the grape, the, the unleavened bread, think about that. That's taken and broken and destroyed and ripped apart because He loves you. Think about that. Precious and pure and perfect and sinless. And it went through what your flesh and your blood deserves. That's what your flesh and your blood deserves. Ripped apart, destroyed, punished. And He took that for you. It's a, it's a moment that brings to mind so many different thoughts and, and it helps you to look at the death and the suffering of Christ and His propitiation for us in a whole different way. Uh, I hope that everybody understands how important the Lord's Supper is. It's very, very important. And it really is wrapped up in those three components. Examining yourself. Just, you know, just like the moment of salvation. It's supposed to bring back to mind the moment of salvation. Where you, you identify you're a sinner. You admit that you're a sinner. You need to examine yourself. You need to reflect. Number one, reflect. Number two, remembrance. Bring to remembrance His death and what He did for us. And actually what He went through for us. And then all of that should bring about communion where we can have the fellowship. That's what brought it for our salvation in the sense that we may be children of God in the first place. But not only that, it can bring about the, fe the fellowship and the, and the communion every day. It can then restore that. It can restore that communion and fellowship. Now at this time, what I'd like to do, if you look in Matthew chapter number 26, I'd like to finish reading. We're going to look in verse 28. Finish reading the next three verses. <coughs> Excuse me. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Verse number 30, it says this. And when they had sung an hymn, they, were, they went out into the mount of of olives. Now I have necessarily no particular hymn uh, picked out. We could maybe uh, uh, sing. I just I, I didn't think of it until this point what hymn we were going to sing. I know we did this last year as well. We can maybe sing. I think it would actually be a good song to sing. Is uh, 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 what is the title of the song? In the garden. I think that would be good because where did Jesus go after this? And that was the beginning. You see his humanity there. Uh, in the garden begins with Adam and Eve, man, and ends with Jesus there and uh, speaks of those things. I think that that would probably be a good song to sing. They sang a hymn at that time just like we're going to sing a hymn. Uh, well, I want this to be as real and, and as uh, alive and fleshly as can possibly be uh, and uh, as similar as it can be to what they experienced. So Brother Hall, will you come lead us in a hymn, please? <clears throat>